Uh, guys, good afternoon. Thanks for staying. For those of you who have been tortured uh, by me all day and yesterday, resisting with resilience is important. Finance, as you know, teaching strength is important, is much more important than other things. So um, let's get into this. Uh, we have a great panel. I'll say just uh, I want to show you two images uh, to kick off on these topics, which I uh, <coughs> partially understand. That's why we have experts here. And, uh, but coming from financial markets, this is a fascinating topic. I agree with what uh, Simon has said, and uh, we need to know more because this is the future is happening and it's all actually it's already happened. So I want to show you this uh, because I, it's, I got a, it's, it's an, an affection problem that I've got because I was in my early, very early, early, early days, I was a runner on the floor of the stock exchange. We was looking a bit like the first panel on the uh, top left a very crowded place where everybody was shouting. In fact, it's called an open outcry, where you can't understand anything of what they say. You have to use your hands to exchange signals. And um, of course, the myth is that the Italians do it better because we move our hands all the time. That's not necessarily true. They do the same in the London Stock Exchange, uh, exactly with the same kind of dynamism. So this is what happened to the trading floors. <coughs> this is happening now. So what we see on the top left is uh, the trading floor a long time ago, then it becomes screens, screens with computers, lots of computers and phones, there's still <coughs> people talking to people at some point, even if they were looking at things, and then there's nobody. This is, uh, <coughs> this is uh, uh, the hardware place where the, um, the software is residing for companies like Citadel or other things, that companies like this that do electronic trading all the time and they exchange an, a, an extraordinary amount of, um, of trades, most of which, by the way, are not dealt, which is one of the part of the high frequency trading, which is fascinating. Uh, I got a very tiny video, one minute at the end to show at close when we finish. If I don't know if it works. If it works, I would like to see that because it's it's a slowed down version of what happens in like in half a second, how many thousands of orders are visually um, seen uh, through one of those networks. So this is <coughs> what's going on now. How many traders and sales do you see now? Not that many. So for <coughs> especially our younger students that want to go to work in investment banking, still a good idea, but you got to get into the idea, the fact that it's, um, there is a lot more software and other type of skills needed beyond being able to understand markets, which is still important, but it's <coughs> I'm not sure it's the only thing needed. And I wanted to show you this picture. Uh, this is an explanation, <laughs> is a visual, visual, visual signal of what happens with high frequency trading and with algo trading. This is uh, one second on the first day of trading on the stock market in New York of the after the IPO of Facebook. This is 2012, so a very old time. So now it's probably 10 times bigger than this. And what you see, each dot that you see is, one is a bid, the other one is an offer. So see how many hundreds of trades were presented to the market in the first one second of trading. You can't see below, but it's, uh, <coughs> this is what happened in one second. Some of those trades were done, others were not done, but this is never going to be, it would never have been possible in an open outcry in a traditional <coughs> way of dealing. It's only possible with these new technologies which our friends will describe. So it's amazing. This is one second of one stock in the opening <laughs> at the beginning. Imagine this going on every day, all day, on all exchanges <coughs> and uh, our colleague over there was explaining us to us that's happening in India at amazing speed, for example, in their stock exchange, which apparently is bigger than I thought, uh, maybe worth uh, a consideration. So just an image to show you how things are changing. This is 2012. Now things are much faster, much bigger, much more difficult. Uh, so I'll, I want to introduce, uh, first of all, I would like to pass my the microphone to uh, my great friend Terence, uh, professor of several things, mostly finance and digital and innovation and other things that we barely understand. He's one of the biggest experts of, uh, of uh, artificial intelligence, writing, writing books on these things. So on that topic, hopefully you can make it understandable for all of us, I would like to ask you uh, first if you can tell us 
how artificial intelligence is impacting our lives now and tomorrow in things like jobs, employment, which jobs are being created, which one are being destroyed, how much cooperation we need with that or we are obliged to have. Thank you. Well, first, thank you very much, Vittorio, for the wonderful um, introduction. Um, it's, it's great to be seeing pictures like these um, because it, it all of a sudden it reminds me that, you know, how fast technology has actually been moving. And of course, you know, in the financial services is usually one of the, the first adopters when it comes to technologies for a very simple reason, because, you know, like time is money. Um, and second, quite a lot of time, like, uh, I mean, very often they are the one who actually has got the capital to invest in. <coughs> so what they are always after um, in financial services is all, always two things. One is speed and the other one is accuracy. Because if you can imagine, right, you know, even if you've got speed, you can actually do your trading quickly. If you cannot get the accuracy right, you have a very high chance of, you know, one, making an amplified loss, and two, um, is the, uh, the you know, uh, uh, failing to, to, to follow compliance. You know, that is already in itself, it, it's, it can be a very huge legal bill bills that come, that, uh, that's coming along. So, um, answering your, uh, your question, um, I think like uh, I've, I've said it many, many times before um, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to actually repeat the, the same thing again like a broken record. Um, and the fact is this, you know, if you are looking at what, what are the things that AI can, you know, like what kind of jobs AI will be mostly el eliminating or basically would be the, you know, what kind of jobs would be the first to be under the, uh, the axe of, of, of AI, it would be those jobs that are one, not physical, because like uh, if, it's, if it were physical, it will be done by robots. Okay, so we're already gone. So it's a physical. So like uh, you know, I'll, 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 and I'll give you an example. Um, um, you know, like uh, the fact is this. You know, um, if you are looking at a job that is physical, it is usually a lot of the time it's actually cheaper to use humans than building a machine. Okay, like uh, I'll give you a very quick example. A friend of mine like um, um, heads um, um, a logistics company in China. And uh, he basically bought a German, sorry, a German company sold himself, like sold itself to the company. Um, basically, what the German companies could do is to use um, uh, machines to actually fetch stuff from the warehouse. Um, the the companies didn't do like a, it was not going very well, so it decided to sell itself to the the Chinese company. The Chinese company bought it. My friend actually said, you know, we'll buy it. First thing he did, basically, took all the stripped out all the machineries, sell them. And then like, uh, why? Because he said it's much cheaper to actually get like a couple of people sit on forklifts and actually do the work much quicker, much faster, much cheaper, right? Now, in that case, apparently accuracy is less of an like, uh, importance than, you know, in financial services, right? So one is physical stuff is, um, you know, like uh, it's, 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 it's not necessary like uh, replaced by AI. Um, what AI can also like uh, another type of like any the characteristics that like uh, you know the, you know that comes with the job that AI will replace, it's basically those jobs that are routine, standardized, right? Um, because AI, you know, like uh, if you think about it, you're using machines to perform the same task again and again and again and again. So uh, you know any jobs that requires like a, a routine, standardized, you know, like uh, you know like uh, actions. They are the they are the first one you know to go, um, and three it has to be something that it has to be a job that has got enough volume, so you have to do it like a lot of times, um, otherwise it's not it's not worth like uh, investing in. So you know a very simple example is you know if you are like uh, processing let's say um, uh, 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 you know a bank account applications, and uh, you decided to use AI to read. Um, um, like a U UK driving license, okay? Um, you, will, you will invest in that, you know, because there are so many people who are actually applying with their UK driving license. Uh, but you would never, at least at this point, you know, like uh, invest the money into reading, say, American driving license, because there are so few of them. You're mu it's much better, much cheaper for you from the investment perspective to actually use humans to actually process those applications. So, um, like uh, for me, like uh, you know, the, the in financial services, those jobs that are basically standard, standardized, 
um, non-physical, usually most of the jobs in financial services is non-physical anyway, um, and uh, routine ones, they are the one to be, uh, you know, like, uh, to be uh, taken away by, by, by AI first. first. Yeah. Which basically means, if I may like, uh, add, right, is this. Um, I think ultimately, you know, I used to work in M&A and, um, and, you know, a lot of the M&A stuff that when I was, when I was at, uh, like uh, in investment banking back then, I was a monkey, basically. And uh, so I believe that a lot of the, of the work that these monkeys could do, like, uh, and they can actually be, you know, it can be done by, 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 by machines. So, because up to ultimately, right, what you're doing is trying to actually, you know, use machines to actually crunch, crunch numbers for, like, uh, in terms of coming up with the valuations, what are the stuff, what are the drivers behind the, you know, that can affect the valuations, and therefore, you know, like, I think what we will see is that AI is gradually going to move up the letter of abstractions when it comes to, you know, the type of jobs, you know, the, 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 the sort of jobs that it can take. So that, away that, from us. That's good news for people like me that can do perform valuations of companies that are not going to be in so much demand. No, in the nothing future. can replace you. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> we all this, know this, that. This can, but maybe the next round we're going to ask Terence which jobs are pro probably being created by this by this uh, shift. So some are going to be gone and others are going to be created and nobody better than him can tell us. So let me pass to uh, our new friend Nilesh and because he's advising on, on um, emerging technology and business on these topics, artificial intelligence uh, here and in, in, in the East, in India especially, what differences and what, what applications do you see which is interesting in India or which is similar or different from what you see over here because you are in both places? Okay. Oh, let me do it. Let me turn it on for you. <laughs> right. Um, so I've got uh, experience of being here in London for 16 years, been there, done that. Uh, I was instrumental in launching Metro Bank. And then I'm five years ago moved back to India and been there for <coughs> five years now. So I've got an experience of both ends of the spectrum. Um, so just picking up from the points that Terence was saying, AI obviously talks of accuracy and speed. So when you talk of accuracy and speed, you have got two levels for that. So if you just touch one of it, AI is more like a wheel. The more you turn, the more accurate it becomes, which means that any repetitive task, the accuracy when it is almost as good as what you're doing, the repetitive task is replaced. And when you do it at a speed, then obviously you are better off having that tool as an AI, which has got a better accuracy and has a speed, which means you are removing that as a job. But Traditionally, what you see is the Western world, because of the industrialization, has got better infrastructure than some of the Asian countries. And because of the better infrastructure, the focus here is always operational efficiency and innovation. So let me come back to that word. Operational efficiency increases your speed in doing the same thing, and then obviously you innovate in that. But sometimes what AI is doing, which is what some of them are getting, probably I would say, I won't use the word concern, but probably trying to notice, it is doing a palindrome shift. It is doing a radical innovation. It is leapfrogging something that you have not even thought of. Some of the jobs that will be there in the next 10 years, they are not even available now. And where AI is coming into picture, in terms of the speed and accuracy on a radical innovation. Just to give you an example, here in UK, uh, there's a lot of focus on increasing operational efficiency in every sector, right from healthcare, fintech, financial services, so you, you name it, like for example, credit services or uh, credit scoring. You're talking of better credit scoring, better healthcare and those kind of things. In Asian country, there's no credit score, there's a huge population, the credit score is not available. So how do you lend money? How does that come into picture? That's where AI is doing a leapfrog and is skipping the entire concept of credit score and then saying that are they eligible to be lent or not? I don't know, I hope you understand. So that's a leapfrog, you are skipping the entire concept of 
credit score and you're saying are they eligible or not. Now we are not going into the part of explainability of AI, which is a completely separate topic. You might argue that if how can we lend somebody if we don't know the steps as to why the AI is saying that we should be able to lend the money to them or not. That's a separate topic. But anyway, um, just to conclude the first part of it is, when you look at AI, you focus on speed and accuracy. There are two levels to it, operational efficiency and innovation or radical innovation and introducing speed and accuracy in that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. This is interesting because um, we know that these proce procedures are going to be bypassed by completely new ideas of doing, especially doing banking in, in, in emerging markets where you don't have the data, you just, people don't have documents, so it's forget about doing the classic, you have to do it in another way. It can be Facebook ask access or other kind of, yeah. of things that they, they can process. So let me ask now uh, my friend Andrea, who's um <coughs> an entrepreneur, by the way, in fintech, and also teaches these things at uh, General Assembly. I would like to know from you, I would like to touch into the blockchain stuff, because it's fascinating things that is difficult to grasp, and how blockchain is immensely um, applied already. We think it's coming, I think it's already here, probably, in things like, I don't know, uh, smart contracts, regtex, and uh, it's been used in food industry in the craziest places. So I would like to ask Andrea to tell us more, because he's, he's an expert of these things, of what he's seeing happening there for us. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, well, I think you made a good point. It's not very much about um, whether it's coming or not. It's very much about what can do for us. Um, you know, there is a very interesting study from Deloitte um, being published at mid-year, um, and it's a survey with all the main uh, CEOs of very big enterprises. And what they all say is that they're all trying to find a good application in their own industry. And this is, I think, the main point. A lot of people couple blockchain with um, the financial industry itself, but it's not just about that. A lot of people focus on cryptocurrency only, on Bitcoin, because it's always in the news. But That's my next question, well, so don't. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but we will get there. But the <laughs> thing is, uh, what I want to stress is really, and kind of links with what you discussed, um, it's very much about the technology itself and how it can solve current problems, but also how it can solve future problems. Because as you correctly mentioned, there is, there is no solution now for future problems because we don't have these problems yet as much as we don't have future jobs yet, right? Um, so I think right now what we really see is that every industry, once they understood that you know, DLT is something that can actually uh, be applied to a lot, of, a lot of industries, they're trying to figure out how to do this in the best way. And you know, automation, um, cost saving, all these kind of trends that we see everywhere, this is where all these business leaders are trying to find the actual, you know, real solution of blockchain. Um, I wouldn't stick very much on new fintech because there are a lot of other industries that are very much affected. As you mentioned, the food industry, but also healthcare, uh, which is a big one. Um, there is, um, I think, a good application on the supply chain itself. Um, and the big, big trend is very much uh, about digital identity, something that not a lot of people speak. Digital um, identity. Yeah, they don't speak very much about it, but the real way of leveraging blockchain is about incrementing the digital identity mm. idea. Actually, there is a very good uh, successful company in India that kind of bypass what you just described. So rather than facing all these issues that we face in the kind of Western world, right, mm. that we're used to that because we have our own procedures, they just jumped that and now they create it through their own um, legal system, like their own identity system in their country. They're able to just implement straight away identity and get this identity trusted through the blockchain and then apply this to everything, every kind of interaction that any person can have um, in this space. So I think these are um, very much, you know, it's a kind an, of overview. An example of those food, sto food story, how can you use blockchain so, with food? Yeah. As in so in the think about it as a, it's like you can mark something and then you can follow this product. And again, as much as it works for food, it works for everything really, even for the glass, right? Um, you can mark it, you can record it. Um, this record gets a unique number that is going to identify this specific object and then this object moves through the supply chain and it gets to a point when you either 
you know, just get, just gets transformed or it just being served on your table, right? And you can track where this good has been all the way along. And this is essentially going to be trusted because rather than you trusting your butcher, you know, on the road, wherever you go by, you, you go to Waitrose, Sainsbury or whatever, you actually can track yourself because the ledger is public. So you can go and see where this piece of meat or this bottle of water has been, where it's coming from, and where it's been the whole, the, the whole process, right? And this is trusted by the whole network. So which means it's not just I see that and I'm telling you it's right, which is basically the way we all grew up really uh, about a lot of things, but it's like it's there, it's imprinted, it can't really be deleted. So it's like, like saying that it's like saying that met cow disease cannot happen anymore because we can trace the cows or we can trace everything. This is amazing development. <coughs> Let me go back to uh, Terence. Uh, of course, we still need to like to see what he sees because he's a, he's a seer. Uh, so uh, being a seer, we want to know yeah. uh, several things. One is that he's an expert on mega trends. We'd like to know more. He's, he's not being, he's being cryptic on trends, but he wa we want to know more. And also about the new jobs that possibly. And also I'm interested to, if you can tell us about the, the financial sector, what do you think is the responsiveness of the incumbent uh, banks and players to the attack of this new players which are probably been disrupting piece by piece the value chain and attacking in the places where they think is interesting. Okay, so first, um, I haven't got an oracle, all right? So um, I'm not really a seer. Um, uh, what, what I can do is offer some observations as much as I like to think I'm, you know, like, a, you know, <laughs> have that ability. Better um, than others. Well, I mean, I, 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 I'm trying. So I think one of the, um, you know, one of the things, so the other day, I was, I think it was two nights ago, you know, like uh, I was actually watching TV and I watch TV all the time um, instead of you know, preparing for my class. Um, I like, uh, so there was uh, like some funky ad uh, on channel four and I was like, what is it all about? And like up like uh, for like uh, the next for the following 30 seconds, like, you know, it's just very funky. I said, okay, you know, what are you trying to say? And then towards the end, it was actually, I think it was Barclays. Um, basically that says, now you can actually, if you, lo like if you ever lost your card, you can actually go onto the phone and turn off the card, okay? So I was like, uh, after I watched that, video, like, uh, that ad, I was saying, okay. This is the response. This is, this is one, worth the bank actually spend the money to produce the ad, to actually promote something that many other banks have already done. Right, the challenger banks, especially the, uh, the, the, the smaller ones. In a faster so way. it basically t tells me like one thing, you know, the, they are nothing more than catching up in many ways, okay? Now, um, so, and I can understand why bigger banks, big banks, they are actually in the catch up mode. Like, uh, so you were saying, right, in the last, you were saying that, you know, there's innovation and there is operational efficiency. For like, uh, for donkey's years, um, retail banks have been like uh, trying to improve their profitability on operational efficiency, right? Whether it's ripping the, the customers off or the employees off. Thankfully, like Diana is not here tonight, otherwise she, like, she would be me. Um, but, you know, that, but you know, to me, that's the that that's, that's, no, that's that no? um, Having said that, you know, so um, banks, bigger banks, they really, what they really, really need to do is to actually create innovations, come up with new things. Um, but they know that given that one, the organization, I mean, there's, it's such a big organization, one of the biggest thing about technology is not the technology itself, it's basically, you know, how do you get around the people issues, the organizational setup, the structure, uh, in order to actually get the technology to work for you. So, you know, like uh, they're big, so that's one. Two, um, we all have habits that is like, uh, that are really difficult to change. So getting people to actually take on new processes is very, very difficult. You know, just try to convince for instance, so like I said, professors to, to use, to do more things online, you know, like uh, it's, it's, it's hard, okay? It's as simple as that, you know, we would still give out papers. Um, three is, is that, um, uh, you know, banks, they have got legacy IT system that cannot really actually get around with. 
is basically IT system is basically nothing more than patches on patches on layers and then more patches. So um, if you want to get them to actually have like a one like a technology that can work like a, that is a, like a uh, flow through, it's very very difficult. So the only way, like, uh, so going forward, what we see is this. It used to be the case where challenger banks just come up and uh, then we are, they face directly, like David and Goliath, you know, against each other between the big and the challenger banks. Now what we're seeing is that going forward, bigger banks will now start to work with more and more with smaller companies and challenger banks. Mm -hmm. Challenger banks, on the other hand, they will start more and more working with the bigger banks. Um, in all likelihood, piggybacking on their infrastructure because they have got the infrastructure. We are going to see a far more um, symbiotic relationship going forward. And that, I think, is making the fintech scene a lot more interesting. You're going, like, uh, going back to like, uh, what you're saying, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the jobs creating are like out of this. Um, it's probably, you know, it, it, you know it is, is a, it's a very long story, right, apparently. But the fact that in fintech, because it's a mixture of old and new, that is going to, going to be the most likely winner. Um, I think the, you know, if you think about it, the skill sets required would probably be, the, you know, like combining old and new. Let's not forget, as investors, and I'm going to actually shut up after that, um, is this. The investors, right, as investors, um, I think investors now, they're actually waking up to the fact that they shouldn't be investing in just technology. They, what they're looking for is business model consistency. So again, you know, we're going back to the more like a human side of things. You know, it's, it's, it's about understanding how the industry works. It's understanding how, you know, customers, what they want and understanding how technologies can actually work. Yeah, I think this is a very important insight for the little <coughs> part that I understand, which is the investing part. This is uh, absolutely true. If you see <coughs> now, thanks God, uh, investors are starting to look at both the technology and the business model because in the last five years the opposite has happened and we could have a situation with somebody like WeWork coming in and pretending it's a tech company when they're a real estate rental uh, office uh, with a $49 billion valuation, which doesn't make any sense. And in fact, now it's tanking and going to zero because people start to realize that that does, doesn't make any sense. So this, 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 this is a good thing. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Nilesh, uh, because he's a consultant, and in, so you are consulting with companies. I, ho I would imagine, are you both sides of, of so the attackers and the defenders, or you're only on one side? Because I've got a few questions about companies like um, Revolut, eToro, uh, I don't know, Satispay, uh, things like this. And um, these companies, uh, think about Revolut is a company that can uh, ex do exchange rates at mid-market. For those of you who know who's, what's mid-market, is an impossibility. I mean, <coughs> dealing at mid-market means you never make money. Yep. It's an impossibility. It's yep. impossible. There is yep. no spread. Yeah. And you never make money. And they do it. So uh, <coughs> how disruptive they are and how, what's the reaction yep. there? Uh, eToro is another thing that is uh, Robin Hood, all these apps free that trade. Can <laughs> free trade, yeah. Can you, can you tell us what you advise these guys to do? <laughs> or not to do? Touching on the business model part, uh, which is very interesting because AI is, is a technology which is still <coughs> maturing. And if you see, the history says that only when the impact of the technology on the organization, both inside and outside, brings about a significant change is when the technology is called as disruptive. So that's the definition. So AI is disruptive or not, is the jury is still out there. But what is more important is the business model. So the business model changes how the technology is used, and that is more important. So if you, if you look at Revolut and any other uh, challenger banks, and some of them bigger names in Asian countries or China, what they are trying to do is they are capturing the market even before the competitor realizes what they are doing. And this is not something which is different in this day and age. I don't know if you know, but PayPal was able to do this. PayPal didn't know what is to be done and they were capturing the market by huge number. It's only then they realized that we should start charging for the money transfer. 
similarly was google google search uh, the advertisements in google started six years after google had uh, started working i don't know if you know but 2000 up to 2003 or 2004 they were not charging and they didn't know that that's the way to make money and now if you see google makes the huge money so what i'm trying to say is again if you look at uh, some of the things like there's a there's a fintech in india called paytm paytm allows you to do a transfer and do a payment and they captured about 200 200 million accounts in a span of less than a couple of months because of demonetization in India. And what they did was, obviously they were not making money. They were trying to capture the market so that they could sell other products and services. Now Paytm has gone into wealth management. Paytm has gone into other products and services. So business model is very important. Again, if you take an example of uh, what happened in China, China when <coughs> um, Alibaba went from e-commerce into financial services the biggest bank in China IC, ICBC said guys you stay in e-commerce banking is not your world or else I will enter into e-commerce Alibaba obviously said no we are going into it so what they did I'll give you an example so tomorrow if Amazon delivers you a book and then somebody from Amazon calls you and says hey would you be interested in understanding more about wealth management would you be interested in seeing if an Amazon consultant would like to talk to you about uh, investment management of your money you would say Amazon into investment management no I'm not interested but what if a bank has got an e-commerce and a book is delivered to you let's say taking an example here in UK is HSBC or Barclays uh, has got an e-commerce and a book is delivered and then somebody calls from Barclays saying hey would you be interested and you would say yes why not so ICBC Bank came up with an e-commerce where the, the GMV was not more than $5 billion. But they made $80 billion through wealth management. So they were able to reach out to all those people and just deliver books. And that's, that's the kind of thing. So the business model has become very important as to what you're thinking. So what Revolut and other ones are doing, yes, absolutely, they probably are not making money right now. But they are capturing market. So they are going down the route of freemium or premium and everything and capturing the market even before somebody else realizes. So from a strategy perspective, if you look at what Christian Slater said, that it's the edge of the market that defines the innovation. So if you're able to capture from the core till the edge in a very fast manner, then you can decide what is to be done. I will just conclude on one point and then give the mic back Alibaba didn't charge anything for the first three years and everybody made huge transactions on Alibaba first year they didn't do second year they didn't do third year they didn't do because they were getting funding from Yahoo after third year Alibaba said guys to all their suppliers they're saying we will close the tap and we will only open it if you pay and just imagine what everybody did because for three years they were used to doing huge business through Alibaba, there's no other option but to pay. And that's where all of a sudden, the revenue model became so phenomenally big that overnight they started making billions of dollars profits. So it is again based on that business model of how you are going to have a technology Im impact the outcome that matters most. Thank you. If I may add something on what you both mentioned, I think it's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I'm a big fan of business cases as well. Um, on the investing side, there is a funny story, if you Google it, about Long Island IST. So there was this company years ago that was called Long Island IST, and then they, they were actually public, and one day they go like, you know what, we're going to go ourselves blockchain in Long Island IST, yes. and their price and spiked price so well, much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when they were asked, are you going to do actually blockchain, they were like, well, maybe one day, who knows, right? So still they got the money, uh, and that's just a funny one. Um, on the Revolut bits and on the Alibaba with, bit, which, is, which are both very interesting, um, about capturing the market, Revolut was born as a solution for banks like Lloyd's, so like yeah. tier two banks, which couldn't really cope with demand on the FX space. So they really didn't, at the beginning, come up with anything rather than an interface, right? Yeah. But what they were able to, able to do was to capture that niche of market that was unserved 
And also, at the beginning, now they got the banking license in the UK, but if you were to open, I don't know how many of you had Revolut before, but if you were to open a bank account with Revolut, you would get a LLOY GB Lloyds bank that account, was right? Yeah. So all they're doing really, yeah. they, they're changing the interface, what you see on the user end, but the infrastructure is very much the old banks. Okay. Yeah. Now the next step, the next challenge, and I link to the Alibaba example is, for banks, if they're smart enough, to offer the API white label solution to everyone. So yep. just, they can't really beat them because they created the user base, but they can just go around them and offer their APIs to companies like Amazon uh, or you know, any, any other e-commerce. Last example is, again, on the Alibaba, they acquired, um, was it six months ago or something like that? They acquired a company, which is called Word First. I don't know how many of you know this company. Mm. And Good. Yes, and they used to serve the mid market, the corporate market, much earlier than Revolut. So essentially, the actual solution <coughs> was there in the market already. But they were just brokers that would charge a lower spread, not zero spread. But they've been in the market, they're a UK company. The guy used to be a trader at Citibank, yeah. and he launched the company, I think, 10 years ago or something like that, 15, around that. Um, and, and they built a lot of market. Now, they were not fancy, they didn't have a fancy app, they still don't but they've been recently acquired by Alibaba. Why? Because Alibaba, as you correctly mentioned, goes like, you know what, I have their demand, I have uh, an e-commerce, now I can serve corporations, they're my main client, I'm gonna give an integrated workflow, like an integrated solution that yeah. can actually serve mm -hmm. my customers in the best way. Yeah, yeah th this is fascinating. Revolut is an interesting story. I, was, I don't know if, uh, if uh, my friend is here. I was, I was trying desperately to get an appointment with the CEO of Revolut called uh, Nick Storonsky, it, went, it became impossible to, unfortunately, short notice because I wanted to. And it, the secretary told me that, uh, first of all, there's got to be a benefit for them to allow anybody in. Secondly, uh, his agenda goes by 10 minutes, so that's fine and it's okay. It's busy people, we understand that. Uh, I'm also very happy to hear about PayPal, the PayPal story because being a shareholder, modest shareholder, I'm interested into, into these things. and uh, and. Um <coughs> More interestingly, uh, do you think, because we've seen, uh, I'm very interested in this story, the business model of acquiring uh, accounts, getting market share, getting access and exploiting it later is perfectly logic and solid, but we've seen lots of times when it didn't work. <coughs> so what I'm saying is companies now, Amazon is profitable, although not hugely by the size of the company. And it, my impression as a non-expert is creating a moat and this moat is getting bigger and bigger at some point, but perhaps it's going to explode, perhaps, I don't know. But this strategy has got to work at some point where the distance between the losses and this happening with the scale up uh, narrow down into profits. Uh, is it going to happen or these guys are going to go upside down? No, no, I mean, I no, don't mean Amazon, of course, but uh, I'm thinking the idea of acquiring market share per se, which has been, which has been, um, um, loved by the markets, by the investors until now, now is being put into question and the solidity of the business model, the capacity to quickly move up with the profit line is getting a lot more important. What do you guys see about this? <coughs> Very interesting question. Um, there are two parts to it. Just an investor's <laughs> question. <laughs> which, which side of the fence you are? Um, I mean, we have seen what WeWork has um, I mean, obviously everyone knows about WeWork and there are so many other uh, companies who have captured and they were not able to capitalize and they were never able to make profits. Uh, there are a couple of other bi big uh, e-commerce company as well, uh, which they couldn't do it. And they had to downsize and, and the name didn't go well. What, what these guys do is they come up with a model and then they try to make profits out of it. Now, not everyone will succeed. Some of them are fast enough and are able to diversify on the same customer base with the products which is profitable. And that's where they make money. Take the case of Google. Search engine, they don't make money. It's the advertisements where they make money. If they wouldn't have introduced advertisements, we wouldn't have had Google. That it's, it's a virtuous cycle. The more you have advertisements, the more you have search engine. But now, because of where we are with the data privacy and all, 
Google and Facebook are being told, guys, you don't have the right to have our data. So now they have to innovate. Will they be able to do it in the next few years? We don't know. But the second part of it, if you are on the other side of the fence, these guys are defining the market. So for example, Revolut is defining a market. The USP of Revolut or uh, any of the challenger bank is to have an exchange rate on a, credit, on a debit card, which is real, almost real time. And for an international traveler like me, it's a big thing. If I'm using it across UK, Europe, and Asian countries, it's a massive thing because banks usually charge anywhere from a couple of percentage plus they make money on the exchange rate and those kind of things. And I've worked in some of the banks here in, in UK um, and they always used to convert it at least twice. So if you pay them in dollars, they would say, oh, we want them in euros, but then they would convert it into through pounds. So every time there would be at least two transactions, they would make money. So the idea is when these guys are looking at that as an aspect, where they're defining a market saying that, hey guys, this is a market, here is a client profile that I'm targeting and they are taking these products and services. If you're on the other side of the fence, you can come up with a product or a service which is profitable from day one and target the same client, Let's target the same profile. So you're profitable from day one and you are able to go after them because the market is defined, the client is defined, the client need is defined, and the client knows, the profile client knows that this is what it is. If there is a better customer service than an XYZ, I'm sure they will jump. Take the case of Metro Bank. I'm not talking of what happened recently. Recently, Metro Bank is not in the news for good reasons, but why was Metro Bank able to capture huge <laughs> fan following yeah from the days when, they, when everybody was going away from the branches. Yeah. So they came up with the concept of branch. And I worked there and I worked with Vernon Hill. So the concept was, it's the business model. We had a couple of principles. They used to say, we are into retail business. We just happen to be a bank. So this was in 2007 and 8. They used to say, you go to a Burger King and McDonald's, you get a burger wrong, what do you say? You just, you get a replacement. You go to a bank, you ask for a credit card, they will say, or oh, credit card or a debit card, they'll say, oh, don't worry, we'll send it to your house uh, in five days or 10 working days. Checkbook, they'll say, oh, we'll send it. And you would accept that. Why would you accept that? So that is where they introduced a better customer service with a branch. And they never called that branch. They used to call that as a store. And the concept is that just give them better customer service with absolutely no competitive interest rate, competitive mortgages. So from day one, we were told that everything is going to be profitable. Just keep it on the margin. It's not like we're going to keep it very high. So it should be market price. So if the market price is 3.5%, keep it as 3.5%. We don't want to go for 3.7 or 3.9. We won't give them too much uh, interest. But the better, best customer service, I don't know if you know, but first year, we had more number of customers coming in and there was an issue of having, there was a possibility of exceeding the second year and the third year targets. And that obviously on the infrastructure would have been a big issue. So they had to scale down saying, oh guys, hold on, we don't want too many number of customers because our USP is customer service. And if you are not able to service them, we won't do it. So Metro Bank, and there are a couple of examples who are on the other side of the fence, they capitalized on the market. So you have to decide where you are going to be. So not every company is going to be profitable. Not every company is going to make a huge um, difference. But I suppose everyone will capture the market. And you have to decide on which side of the fence you are. Okay. Thanks. I've got one more question each for one for Ted and one for Andrea. Then I want to show you just like one thing on, on algo trading uh, because it's so cool to see that it's, I cannot resist <laughs> in my financial crap, bullshit, basically, crap. yes. Yeah, so, but because right. Terence is here, it's did so difficult, say, yeah. Did you, did you say crap? Yeah, yeah, did, yeah. Uh, it's impossible to get hold of him normally and for more than three seconds, as you can see from his busy attitude. And he's studying trends and he's, is, what's, is what's the question? The question is, <laughs> can you tell us 
because I tried before you didn't, of course, answer anything. Uh, and about these mega trends you're studying, at least the ones which What's are really. <laughs> the question is, what are what do you see in these mega trends in artificial intelligence in utilization? I think the trends that you see in s what's going to happen in society with when these things are happening because you are studying the effects of this uh, on demographic or lo on lots of other things reading your books right. which I suggest you go everybody does but right, I'm, I'm gonna I'll try to as <coughs> make it as brief as, as brief as possible first uh, I want to focus on you know algorithms because you know like otherwise I can, you know like, uh, we'll be talking but like I'll be still talking about it for like the next 15 hours um, I think like uh, there are a couple of things that AI algorithms are actually being introduced that is really um, turning many aspects of financial services upside down. Um, so for instance, um, robo-advisors was one of the biggest things like, uh, around. And, uh, and uh, at one point I remember, probably two years ago, when robo-advisors really actually at the peak of its, you know, like a conversation, like at the peak of everyone's like a conversation. Um, it was seen as the way to actually repeat, like, uh, replace a lot of the frontline stuff, okay? Um, especially those who are you know, trying to sell financial products. Advisors. Financial advisors. Financial advisors, right? Um, did it really happen? No. I think one of the reasons why it didn't really happen was, um, one, the capability was very, very limited. I mean, banks were actually trying to be very smart. They're saying, listen, you know, if you have got a lot of money, we'll send a financial advisor human f in human form to serve you, right? But if you have got like uh, very little assets to, to invest, I'm terribly sorry, you have to resort to the cheap robots, right? I think that, that itself is, is, is one turn off. And second is this, if, if anything, um, a lot of the time what you, see, like, uh, what you see is that those people who actually got the money, they tend to be higher educated, better educated, they would rather actually do it things themselves. It is exactly the opposite, which are basically the people who need help that they need to want to talk to humans. And besides, you know, if you ask me, right, whether to hand over my money to a human or to a machine, I would probably hand over to a human still, you know, like uh, when it comes to investment. Okay, that's, that's how I, you know, I'll trust the, like, uh, the, the humans more, right, for, for whatever reasons. Um, so, I think like, uh, you know, in many ways, um, jobs are not really disappearing as quickly as, as we, you know, as we, as we anticipated. On the other hand, for those jobs that require much less human interactions, right? So like, like you were saying earlier on, um, a lot of the, the uh, you know, like a citadel, right? They are basically all quant stuff. Um, and um, I, I remember it was the, um, you know, about, you know, like, uh, I think it was about six years ago, I think. You know, if you were, like, if you were, like, 10, 10 15 years ago, if you actually got a PhD in finance, you were, like, a, you will be hired in no time because, like, uh, everyone is, like, looking for, like, uh, quant monkeys, okay? Um, but, you know, six years ago, if you actually have got a PhD in finance, you'd be very lucky if you're actually working in, in like, a mid-office. Right. Because a lot of the algo, like algo, like a, like a, a lot of the trading part is actually done by algo. So um, when it comes to investing, like uh, when it comes to those things that requires a lot of calculations, accurate calculations, speedily, speed and accuracy. Again, you know, those are the things that are inevitably going to be taken all of, over by machines. Okay. Um, another thing that, like, uh, I think, like, uh, when it comes to trading, is this. It's not always actually the trading part that involves technologies. A lot of the time, it is actually the processing and making sure that you know the uh, that the orders actually go through properly and regulatory like a compliant. Inside. That is the key, right? Um, because like uh, you know, if, if you make a wrong trade and the trade or the trade is like a not uh, like a non-compliant, <coughs> again, big fine. So I think like a more like an AI would actually be you know deployed in that in the back end sense. Um, because one is a lot easier to, to, to put in, and two, you can actually see the tangible results as opposed to robo advisor. Uh, that, that is very true. Citadel is a good example. It's this huge trading house in Chicago where you see now there are about uh, 10, 15 traders looking at the screen, about 500 uh, mm. quants look yeah. at, uh, creating the algo. So this is, I'll show you one in a second because it's so cool. And you can go and find out there is a movie on Citadel. You can see that it's scary. And if you want to be, yeah. you don't want to, you know, unless you want to have a 
PhD in astrophysics, uh, which is probably yeah. needed now. Finally, Andrea, uh, we need to you know, need to know a little bit more about this uh, because I'm, um, I don't know what to do with with this Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency. If we need to invest or not, I couldn't make up my mind, and uh, I haven't yet. And I suspect it's going to go up, but I don't really know, so I don't un quite understand. And and m more seriously, uh, there is new things happening like tokenization, tokens new markets, cryptocurrencies are, some people say, are liberation, which is an interesting and appealing and intriguing thing. It's a liberation from the slavery of central banks and fiat money, which is based on absolutely nothing. Some people say that uh, these, these currencies are certainly a bigger store and certain, more certain store of value than fiat currencies. They might or not have a point. It's a very interesting debate and I'd like to know what you think about this. Yeah, um, well, we have to break down this question in different points, really. Um, first, I'm not Oracle, so I don't know whether it's going to go up or down. I'm sorry. I mean, any fine you, I wouldn't tell you. But anyway. Um, like you I, <laughs> no, but really, um, I think, you know, um, if you want to make some kind of valuation around it, um, Bitcoin itself is very much about adoption now. Two things that we, uh, we always discuss when I teach at least, you know, there are the basics as an asset. You can look at the, you know, volumes, like all the, the, the basic metrics, really. Um, but there are a couple of things which are very specific. So there is the uh, adoption part, which is very important. If you remember, at some point, Bitcoin went very much up, right? And then Microsoft gets in and says, we're not going to accept Bitcoin anymore, and it drops. Now, does it really jeopardize the value of Bitcoin, the fact that they don't take it and they don't accept it anymore? Not really as an asset, but the non-acceptance of a very big, big company that brings trust into the asset, of course, has this kind of, um, of effect, which gives it uh, a lot of volatility, really, which is why it makes it kind of less secure at our eyes. Um, and then there is regulation. Regulation, which is a big, big thing, not about Bitcoin only, but it's very much about every um, cryptocurrency. Now, regulation really struggles to keep up. Um, they're trying recently, England, Bank of England published something which was uh, very interesting, um, especially in the asset tokenization bit. Uh, but again, it's like it takes um, a long time because it's something that is very new. It's very uh, not much defined yet, uh, potential, what can be done, what can't be done. And we all think about it as a mainstream uh, solution, but it's very much not because it's very young. Uh, I'll give you an example. You think about the amount of transactions that you can actually do, and you think, oh yeah, blockchain is very disruptive, Bitcoin, you can actually do seven transactions per second. Uh, at its best, you can do 27. You know how many you can do, you know how many you can do Visa, which is one of the oldest technologies? 24,000. Mm -hmm. So yeah. old technology is still the better one. Yeah. But it's the whole, Technology behind, which is revolutionary, as you know, I mentioned in my um, in, in my previous bit. Now, linked to this is like you asked me whether it's you know liberation fraud. On the fraud bit, I could tell you, you know, go out to a black taxi, um, black cab truck, black cab taxi driver, and you ask him what he thinks about Uber, right? What do you think he's gonna tell you? He's not gonna like it. Why? Because he kind of jeopardizes his position of power in the market. So if you hear people like Jamie Dimon or anyone else really and they just say bad things about Bitcoin itself, they're kind of justified. Uh, like 50% they have a point. They don't they, say it anymore. They don't say it anymore, yeah. right? But you, you, you see what I mean, right? Of course they will never promote something that brings a change in the industry. And about liberation, yeah, well, you know, it kind of changes the market as we know it, because you can't really do monetary policy with Bitcoin, right? So it's it's a very different way of intending. It's a, good thing. It's a very it's a very different way of intending it, and it's like governments, of course, are concerned about it because this takes power away from them. Now the challenge, the very interesting challenge is, they will try and build their own cryptocurrencies. Europe is doing that already. But isn't that counterintuitive? Because that's meant to be something that is distributed and you're privatizing it again. So, you know, it's like a very blurred, uh, very blurred space. Um, and then there is, I think, the most interesting bit, which is the tokenization part. Tokenization. Mm. So yeah. that's, that's, the, that's, that's what really makes the difference because mm. you can have as many cryptocurrencies as you want. I don't even know how many we have now, but we have like a lot. Yeah. Um, and it's very easy to create more and more. 
-hmm. Now, we see tokenization as the actual application of the solution itself to different problems. Um, I like to think of, about it, uh, you know, ar around three kind of applications, really. So we have the normal ICO, as we know it. So you just create your own currency, and that's it. Um, you have the securitization. So essentially, what you do, rather than creating a structured product, you create a basket of tokens. And the utility of that is that you can actually get access to fractional ownership of things, right? Yeah. So things that, you know, maybe they had a very big ticket, you couldn't really access them. This, gives, this allows you um, to get hold of different securities. I don't know if you heard, but uh, one of the things that is discussed right now is SpaceX and the tokenization of the SpaceX ownership. So Elon Musk itself is actually thinking of doing that. Mm. And, you know, it's pretty smart, that guy. So. Uh, other than the Tesla truck, but that's a different story. And it would even replace shares, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah. think about a share, right? Yeah. And it's share, very share tokenized, yeah. Yeah, and, but it, it, it's just like it's the same concept. Now, what is the difference? Is that think about all the legal yeah. process that you have to go through mm. to issue shares, to go public in the London Stock Exchange, yeah. right? Mm. Versus actually doing it online. And by the way, it's news of today. The London Stock Exchange got a partnership with one of the major players, which is uh, AALX, if I'm not wrong, um, which is a Chinese company who kind of trades. It's one of the major exchanges. And now they're offering cash uh, futures and other derivatives on the London Stock Exchange with real-time trading. So this tells you that even the old institutions are understanding that this is the trend. And, and um, the third bit um, is going to be utility. So if you think, uh, I'm actually working with some interesting startups right now, and all of them, they see the application, not of cryptocurrencies themselves, yeah. but the tokens. Mm. So you can get access to premium products, to premium service, if you collect enough tokens. And this is not rock and science. I don't know how many of you have an Amex, but when you spend your money with an Amex, you get points each pound that you spend, double if you do that in a foreign currency, by the way. But that is exactly the same concept, right? So it's very much digitalizing what we used to do in a different way. Um, and I think this is very much what it's gonna be like. So I don't know, I think you should really, 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 if you want to get a grasp of what is gonna happen next, um, it's very much about the technology. And getting back to your point, like technology in 2019 going to 2020 in a month is not really a problem. <coughs> there is technology. It's very much about capturing the right problem yeah. and solve for that problem. Just one last bit. Um, this moves back to the previous question, which was, you know, you can apply the same technology, as you mentioned, um, on different markets. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been in Italy last week. It's one of the worst places in terms of digitalization of finance. Yeah. And I'm telling you, a lot of startups um, are coming up now offering things that for us in London, in England, they're like normal. Like, you look at them and you're like, yeah, why? couldn't you not have that. But for them it's not, and in many other countries as well. So you just need to get the right technology and apply to different demands. And this is gonna take everyone at some point to the same level with the you know, frog lips that you, you mentioned earlier as well. I think that's a very good point. Not all the countries start um, on the same level of challenge, but they can definitely get up to level. This is very interesting. Just to signal a, cha a radical change in state, uh, in, in, in political position by the Chinese government, which is ba has been banning all these currencies and, and ICOs and stuff for a few years, now it's completely changed its, its position and is now favoring the adoption of these things. This is going to be immensely a sea change for everybody because that kind of radical adoption of this new technology over there is going to be some meaning. So let's see what happens here. We got to wrap it up. I wanted to show you this because I can't resist, I mean, come on, this is too cool. This is an algo trader, one of the million examples of the things that Terence uh, and my friends were talking about. This is a market making, you see here, bid 13.10, offer 11, and it, inside there is a thing called market touch, so the spread is ridiculous, right? Because it's 0.01 percent, it's nothing. Now, what happens in an algo trading? The algo trader, which is an is, is a per, is not a person, is a computer program, reads things and decides. Um, around 40% four, of trades on American stock exchanges now are done by computers mo and growing, okay? It's done by this kind of things. Here you see something like these guys, this guy, 
<coughs> puts an order. He basically wants to buy 100 lots. These are lots of futures, okay, in a very liquid contract. He wants to buy 100 lots. So he's here. He's at the back of the queue. There are 600 on the bid. He's at the back of the queue. So he wants to buy. In order to buy, instead of paying up and lifting the offer at 11, which is what you do if you are in a hurry, you want, you want to say one cent, which is important when you're talking about billions, okay? And so he, wa he wants to be hit. So he's sitting there waiting to be hit. To be hit, he puts his real order in, and then just one touch, one, one point above the touch, he puts a large order, which is totally fake. It's legal, but it's fake. He's showing a 4,000 in ads for sale. So computers that respond to algo will read the unbalance and say, oh, there is a lot of people selling huge amount of stuff and very little people buying. So the computer will jump ahead in a millisecond and start selling because the bid side is weak. So it's going to cause the price to go down. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what happens when this happens. In reality, he's a buyer, but he's showing a big sale order. He doesn't want to sell 4,000. He wants to buy 100. And he's a, he's a trap, he's a trick, he's a hook for computerized trading that reads the unbalanced volume with very complex uh, equations. Uh, and they see there is an unbalance. Every time there is an unbalance, they will try to front run and do whatever is, wherever the market is going to go in the, in the easier direction, up or down. The opposite can be exactly the same. And this is an example. So you want to buy, and this is bordering on illegal. And this is it's still legal, but it's possible because of high frequency trading, which is an amazing phenomenon where you have millions of these orders, of which only a super tiny fraction is really executed, but it's enormous influence on where the market is going. This is changing things because this is going to be a lot more dangerous trading for real people because markets are going to have a lot more volatility in the future. They're already showing it this year and last year. The more computerized trading is happening, the more it, there is an emphasis in fluctuations. It's amazing.